Hello, welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world, and so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing remarkably well. I'm doing great, thank you very much, and I'm so delighted you've joined me for part three of our story tonight. And we're about to learn what it is that has kept Aoife away from her hometown for so long. Something clearly happened to her that forced her to abandon her baby and her husband. And perhaps we're about to find out what it is. So let's continue with part three of our story. It all began one fine summer's evening, after dinner at my mother's house. Or you could describe it as late afternoon, as it wasn't exactly dark yet. I thoroughly enjoyed eating an evening meal with Andrew, his wife, and my mother at Golden Sands. I still recall exactly what we had for dinner that night. My mother had prepared a mouth-watering chicken and mushroom taglatelli, my all-time favourite meal, served with French salad and garlic bread. It's amazing what you can recall when a period of time is deeply imprinted on your mind, like a photograph that cannot be erased. I still recall the vivid smells, tastes and even conversations we had together that night. They seem to be permanently entrenched in my memory, like the firm cement that has finally set after a building project has been completed, leaving behind an imprint in the cement that simply cannot be swiped away. That night the food was absolutely delicious, a little heavy perhaps on the stomach, so working it off with some exercise was on the cards for me. It seemed like a great idea, especially after the doctor had encouraged us to take more exercise. I decided to take a leisurely stroll on the beach. It was six o'clock and still reasonably light outside, although by 7.30 it would invariably be dark. Nobody batted an eyelid when I left for a walk, as I did every day, like clockwork after dinner. As in this part of the world, it always felt safe walking on your own. Although I do recall remarking to my mother that in the last week or so, I had felt as if I was being watched when I went out for my regular walk, which my mother pooh-poohed as being all in my imagination. Oh, honestly, Eva, you really are the end, you know. Don't give anxious thoughts like that any credence. Of course nobody's watching you. The beach is very secluded, and anybody on it is probably just local. I very much doubt anybody is watching you. You need to block out those negative imaginations of yours. That kind of thinking can bring on all manner of anxiety disorders. And I certainly don't want that happening to you, love. The last thing we need is for you to go on anxiety medication. You must stop worrying about Richard's sperm count, for goodness sake. If you allow your nervous energy to consume you, then falling pregnant will almost certainly elude you. It doesn't matter how many times you walk up and down the beach with little Snoopy. It's not going to make any difference until you master your mind. And when you do that, you'll be pregnant sooner than you know how to say Jack Robinson. At the time, my mother had a beagle called Snoopy, who loved coming for regular walks with me. I would take him in the mornings and the late afternoons or early evenings, and little Snoopy was under the mistaken impression that although he was my mother's beloved dog, that he belonged to me. I loved that dog like no other dog on this entire planet. He was incredibly special to me, so well behaved, and just an all-round great companion. It was a spectacularly beautiful evening, as I happily trotted out onto the beach with Snoopy by my side. I really enjoyed these late afternoon walks after dinner. I eagerly discarded my slip-slops after I descended the steep stone steps that were built into the hillside so that I could thoroughly enjoy my walk bare feet on the soft sea sand that massaged my toes and was still pleasantly warm to the touch. I'd also enjoy the cool foamy water that would bathe my feet at regular intervals. Me and Snoopy walked across the sand together leaving behind us a trail of imprints that would soon be washed away by the rambunctious water. I was wearing black leggings at the time and a cool cotton pink top that fell above my knees like a short dress. It was pleasingly warm 
There wasn't a solitary soul in sight. Snoopy ran ahead of me, running towards the waves, chasing after them as they rolled towards the shore. Together we sashayed towards the vast congregation of sculptural rocks clustered together in voluptuous formations, and where the waves eagerly whipped against them. In the furthest distance, a lush green woodgrove of trees framed the cul-de-sac at the far end of the beach. The walk to the cul-de-sac was a good twenty-five minutes or so. If I was to take a very long walk, then I might decide to walk through the trees to get to another beach. But on this occasion my energy reserves were rather depleted, and my stomach still remained rather full after supper. So as I reached the end of the beach, when I was about to turn around to make the return journey back to Golden Sands, I was suddenly gripped with a great feeling of uncertainty. The feeling grabbed me forcefully, so much so that all I wanted to do was to run across the beach back to Golden Sands as quickly as I could. It was almost as if I could smell danger on the wind, rather like a deer might cautiously pick up the smell of a coyote and get the hell away as fast as it could. Let's just say I knew that something was decidedly off, although I didn't know quite what it was. It certainly didn't help, of course, that Snoopy began to bark fiercely at the woods, as if he had gleaned that there was something there that he didn't like at all. That was when I saw the man running towards me. I'd never seen him before. "'Excuse me, ma'am,' he called out to me. "'Excuse me, ma'am. Do you have a cigarette? I really need a smoke.' I stared in bewilderment at the stranger. He looked to be a rather normal young man, roughly around about my age, but I'd never seen him before, and the way he darted out of those woods towards me was rather predatory. It had scared the life out of me, but surely he was only harmless. Soon the stranger had caught up with me. He appeared to be standing only inches away from me, and close up I didn't like his appearance at all. There was something so soulless about his dark eyes, and the clothes that he was wearing looked like they hadn't been changed in a whole week. The man had stubble on his chin, and he smelt slightly of booze, although he didn't appear to be very drunk. Snoopy was growling at him furiously, and he was by nature a friendly dog, so his growling was rather uncharacteristic for such a good-natured canine friend. So I took his growling as a warning. There was something insidious about this stranger. He set my nerves on edge. Sorry, I said quickly, waving my arms around in a dismissive gesture. I turned around to walk away from the stranger as quickly as I could. I'm afraid I don't smoke, and I don't have any cigarettes on me. Ma'am, please stop. I just need a moment of your time, the man called after me, running up to me again. I stopped briskly in my tracks and turned around to look directly at him. He was seriously beginning to annoy me. Do you have any spare change? he asked me. No, I said. I'm sorry, I don't carry spare change with me. I'm walking my dog on the beach. I don't carry money with me. I hurriedly turned around, with Snoopy dashing ahead of me. I didn't want to run away, because that would expose my uncertainty and my vulnerability rather like a translucent dress that leaves little to the imagination. I didn't want this young man to know that he had ruffled my feathers and made me feel very disquieted. If a predator can sense your vulnerability, it makes you become an easy target. I was very much alone on this sequestered beach, and very much aware of it. I only had Snoopy for company. It was regretfully beginning to grow dark, as splashes of golden orange light lit up the horizon and dappled the ocean with a silvery glaze, but that too was fading away. I needed to get away from this man as quickly as I possibly could. He was probably completely harmless, I told myself, but a tiny, still small voice in the back of my head made me feel otherwise. Walk as fast as you can. Don't run. Don't you dare run, the voice told me. I fought against this internal dialogue as all I really wanted to do was to run away as fast as I possibly could. My heart thundered violently in my chest, and the blood boomed in my ears. Indeed, it was so loud it blocked out the sound of the crashing waves, thunderously beating against the rocks. To my horror, the man continued to run by my side. 
Are you rude or something, ma'am? Did you not hear what I asked you? Have you got some change for me, so I can buy some cigarettes? I'm desperate. I need a smoke. I was startled that the man should ask me this. I shrugged my shoulders nonchalantly, as if what he was asking me was completely normal. I told you. I'm sorry. I haven't got any cigarettes, nor have I got any change. Now, please, will you go away? My dog doesn't like strangers. You can see he's growling at you. Before I could do anything, the man lunged towards me with one powerful hand, thrusting me back onto the sea sand, and then I could feel the cold metal of a knife at my throat. Snoopy began to bark incessantly, jumping up at the man and trying to nip the back of his leg, and that didn't go down at all well with him as he kicked back. Tell your dog to shut up, to stop nipping me, or I'll kill him. Get that bloody thing off me, or I'll chop him up into pieces. Do you understand? Snoopy, Snoopy, stay right there. Stay, Snoopy, stay. Snoopy sat down obediently on the beach, waiting for the man to finish his business with me, although I could hear him whimpering. I don't think he understood what was going on. I knew I needed to obey this man if I wanted to come through this ordeal alive. I do recall there was a jagged, ugly scar running down his cheek and there were pockmarks on his face that suggested at one time when he was younger he might have had an issue with acne. I noticed his fierce, hooded, dark eyes were full of a vindictive hatred. He seemed to be like a misogynist that absolutely abhorred woman and had a vendetta against the female species. I knew this attack was all about exerting his power and dominance over me so that I would feel helpless and wretched. That's exactly what he wanted. The man began to ruthlessly pull off my leggings. He ripped them off like a pair of scant tights. I closed my eyes tightly as the rape began. It was almost as if my consciousness floated out of my body while this was all transpiring, as if I was watching the event up in the sky as I looked down on myself, almost as if it was happening to somebody else that was not me. I have heard that this often happens to victims of rape and even people who prostitute their bodies for a living. They just physically disconnect as they abandon their physical bodies while they're being exploited. I whimpered out in pain. The man was pulling my hair back so hard that it rarely hurt. He pinned his lips to my ear and whispered, Shut up, you bitch! If you dare scream, I'll slice your neck open. Do you understand, bitch? I'll leave you to die, to bleed out on this beach. The man continued to rape me, and I completely disengaged from the experience, almost as if I was not on the beach, in my own body, nor was I being dominated by this man's formidable hold. It was as if I was somewhere else. But suddenly my thoughts were interrupted by this loud screaming, Put me down! Put me down! Stop! Help! Help! The man sounded beside himself with absolute terror, as if he was the one that was now being attacked. I realised that he'd released his formidable hold from me. I could no longer feel the cold metal of the knife against my neck, and I was wondering why. I sat up with a start, looking rather bemused. Snoopy ran hurriedly over to me, throwing himself into my arms, licking me all over with his pink tongue, as if I was a popsicle. I knew he was trying to comfort and console me, for he knew I'd been attacked on the beach by this insidious, unsavoury character. The man was screaming, Put me down! Help! 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 The knife he'd been holding had fallen onto the beach sand. I hurriedly reached out to grab it and threw it into the ocean, where it was submerged by the waves. I looked up to see my attacker, was now about seven foot in the air, dangling precariously from the arms of a powerful creature. I rubbed my eyes. Was I seeing this right? I realised the creature holding the man in the air was a male Bigfoot. He was enormous. He took my breath away. He was built like an army tank with formidable shoulders and a powerful ripped body that he would have been quite literally a Goliath among men. He was covered in cinnamon-coloured hair and his face rather reminded me of an Indian warrior with those typical high cheekbones and deep-set dark hooded eyes. The man who attacked me was wiggling and kicking his legs and arms around and screaming out, for the Bigfoot to put him down. I watched in absolute awe 
as the Bigfoot ran directly into the water with the man in his arms, and I could see the large creature holding him under the water. The man thrashed about, trying to fight against the powerful, forceful hold of the Bigfoot. But the wrestling soon stopped, and then the Bigfoot let go of the man, and his body seemed to bob up and down in the water. I knew he was dead. I felt no remorse for him whatsoever. The Bigfoot walked out of the water towards me. I noticed he'd only got wet up to his knees. The creature sashayed over to me, and then he sat down next to me on the beach, almost as if we were long-lost old friends. I could hear his breathing, see the rise and fall of his chest, which was oddly comforting for me. I sat there, feeling very much at ease with the Bigfoot by my side, and with Snoopy cuddled up in my arms. I stared out at the waves and watched the body of the dead man bobbing up and down in the water, like a log. It really was a surreal feeling. My leggings lay across the beach sand, like a pair of black stockings. I only had on my loose cotton pink shirt. At least I had some modesty left. Soon it began to get dark, but I remained seated next to the Bigfoot. We watched the ocean together, and I stroked Snoopy, and nothing was said, nor was anything needed to be said. My dog went over to the Bigfoot and began to lick his hands, and I remember the Bigfoot chuckled, looking up at me through twinkling eyes, and he also stroked my dog. I smiled at the Bigfoot warmly. I do not know why I felt so at ease in his company, but I did. I didn't even thank him for coming to my rescue, but I just continued to sit there. It was almost as if I was coming to terms with the aftershock of what had happened to me. The Bigfoot seemed to understand this. He reached over to me and patted me gently on the arm, like he'd done with my dog moments before. I think the Bigfoot was encouraging me to get up and to go back home. I reluctantly rose to my feet, and with only my top on, I carried my leggings in my hand. The Bigfoot continued to walk by my side until I reached the hilly slope where I'd left my slip-slops. I needed to take the stone steps up the hill, and then I would be in the yard of our property. The Bigfoot nodded at me, and then I watched him turn around and run down the beach, and he ran so gracefully, like a fast-moving wind, until he was all but a dot on the horizon. I was so desperately grateful he'd come to my rescue, and I thought nothing of the deceased corpse now floating in the water. I know it sounds strange, but even though no words were spoken between me and the Bigfoot, it was as if thousands of unseen words had been communicated between the two of us, as if the Bigfoot knew my every thought. When I arrived back at the house, I observed my mother, my husband, sister-in-law and brother were all laughing madly as they watched a television programme together. It was clearly a comedy of some kind. I was certainly not going to join them under any circumstances. I slipped clandestinely into the house and went to the on-bathroom suite of our bedroom. I scrubbed myself in the shower so hard that every trace of that man was rinsed off me. My encounter with him made me feel filthy dirty. I had decided that no one must ever know what had happened to me. I was young, callow, and very naive at the time, far too afraid to tell anyone about the stranger on the beach that had raped me. In some ways I blamed myself for what had happened, and I'm not exactly sure why, because I was innocent of everything. I'm sure other victims of such insidious crimes feel exactly like I did at the time, which is why I believe so many rapes are not reported. All you want to do is wash yourself as rigorously as you can to get rid of the person that attacked you. You also want to forget that the incident happened at all. Furthermore, the last thing you want to do is to humiliatingly go to the police and have your body prodded as DNA evidence is extracted from you. The truth was the man that had attacked me was now thankfully dead, and I was grateful to the Bigfoot. So as far as I was concerned, I wanted to put this all behind me. By the time my husband had returned to bed that night, I was fast asleep, thanks to a couple of sleeping tablets I had taken, because there is no way I would have got to sleep without them. Snoopy was lying between my legs. The following morning when I woke up, the events of the previous night came flooding back to me. For a brief moment, I wondered if it had all just been a hideous nightmare. But the burning pain between my legs told me otherwise. Are 
you all right, dear? My mother asked me when I came into the kitchen the following morning. You didn't join us last night when you came back from your walk on the beach. We were watching a wonderful comedy on television. It was terribly funny. Richard said he found you fast asleep in the bed, cuddled up to Snoopy. I was rather worried about you. It's not like you to just bog off to bed like that, without even wishing any of us good night before you go. Oh, I shrugged my shoulders. I just guess I was just very tired. Well, as long as that is all it was, love. If you don't mind my saying, you look rather peaky. In fact, your face looks terribly white. I hope you're hungry, dear. I'm making blueberry pancakes for breakfast. And by the looks of you, you could do with something to eat. Sounds lovely, I said, trying to sound upbeat. But the last thing on my mind was food. Moments later, my brother came into the kitchen. Ah, something smells jolly good in here, he said, giving me a wink. It's your favourite, love, said my mother. I'm making pancakes with maple syrup and crispy bacon, just the way you like it. Mum, you're the best, said my brother. No wonder me and the wife moved in with you. Nothing beats one of your great breakfasts, he said, giving my mother a cheeky nudge. Honestly, Andrew, said my mother, you are the end. Before long, we were all gathered around the table. My husband Richard was sitting next to me at the breakfast nook. He got a text on his cell phone and began to read it. You're not going to believe it, he said, taking a sip of his orange juice. A dead body has been recovered, washed up on the beach around here. A dead body, said my mother, sounding aghast. Are you sure? I inwardly winced when I heard this news. I knew the dead body was of the stranger that had attacked me the previous night. No, I'm not joking. Pearson Galloway went for a late-night stroll on the beach. He was suffering from insomnia again. That's when he observed the body floating in the water. At first he thought it was a log. But with a flashlight, he got a closer look and observed a face. He got the shock of his life. He found a deceased man wearing a red T-shirt and black shorts. There was no identification on him. But he must have been a smoker. There was a wet box of cigarettes in his pocket. Poor, poor man, said my mother. The water is freezing cold. He could have easily caught hypothermia. I never told my family members what I knew. But the body recovered on the beach, which became a John Doe, as no one knew who he was. They didn't know where he came from, and there was no man fitting his description that had been reported missing. So the man I'd encountered on the beach remained an enigmatic mystery that would not be discovered for many years. Maybe I would never know who he was, and I was all right with that. Sometimes the less you know about something, the better. It was shortly after this unfortunate incident, when I'd been cruelly raped by this man, who didn't deserve to be called human, that I was to discover I was pregnant. I remember that when I took the pregnancy test for the first time in my life, I was hoping with all my heart it would read not pregnant. The two blue lines confirmed my very worst fears. Tears spilled down my cheeks. What if that man on the beach had made me pregnant? It didn't bear thinking about. I remember it took me three weeks to summon up the nerve to tell Richard the news. You're pregnant? Are you sure about this? He asked me. I'm sure, I nodded, showing him the two blue lines of the pregnancy test. Richard's eyes grew round as saucers as he read the test results and insisted I took two more pregnancy tests to be absolutely sure that I was indeed pregnant. And when they were all confirmed, he swooped me up in his arms with delight. I don't think I'd ever seen him look more happy. You have made me a very happy man, sweetheart. You are pregnant. Fancy that. We're about to have a baby and I couldn't be more delighted. But what would you have done, Richard? I asked him. If we couldn't have a baby at all. Supposing it was impossible physically for me to get pregnant. What then? Richard thought about the question for a moment. Well, you know what? I wouldn't be adverse to adopting. But thank God we don't have to explore that avenue. I was relieved when Richard said this to me. 
because it meant he was prepared to love a baby that might not actually be his, and the less he knew about the matter, the better. I had done researches online and discovered that many men were raising children that they believed were their own. I just knew that I could never tell Richard our baby could be the progeny of another man. The thought of it just did not bear thinking about. Do you know what, love? When the doctor told me my sperm count was poor, I was very offended by the whole thing. But you know what? I've obviously changed by transforming my lifestyle, improving my eating habits, embarking on a rigorous exercise program. So I suspect I've improved my sperm count exponentially. It was true that our doctor assured Richard that the positive changes he had made had ensured that I had fallen pregnant. Did I not tell you, Mr. Douglas, if you took better care of yourself, you would get this lovely wife of yours pregnant? And it seems I was not wrong about that. I could only hope clandestinely in my heart that the beloved baby I was carrying inside me did not belong to the insidious John Doe character that wantingly attacked me on the beach that day. I couldn't tell Richard about what had happened to me that evening. I refused to allow myself to even think of the incident, as such ominous memories brought back dark flashbacks that would send me into a panic. Everyone was beyond delighted that I was pregnant. When my beautiful baby girl was born, it was love at first sight for me and my husband Richard. He was absolutely thrilled with our brand new baby. We decided to call our little girl Chloe. When I looked into her beautiful face, I saw absolutely no trace of the monster that had raped me on the beach. No, she had to be Richard's child. I was certain of it. I refused to believe otherwise. At that time, me and my husband Richard had left Golden Sands, so we were no longer living with my mother, with my brother, and his wife. Instead, we'd moved into our designer house we had built, where we had prepared the most perfect nursery for our little girl in pink. My only regret was it was about a ten-minute drive to the beach, so I very much missed my childhood home. Oh, goodness gracious me, Richard's mother had said when she first laid eyes on little Chloe. She looks just like you, Richard, dear. Oh, goodness gracious, Chloe's got your eyes and your hair and your cute little dimples. She takes after you, Richard. You look just like her when you were born. I remember thinking to myself that the man on the beach who attacked me had sandy coloured hair and dark brown eyes. My little girl did not. I began to persuade myself that Chloe was indeed Richard's little girl, and the relief I felt about this conviction was immeasurable. I could not have stomached it at all if I had believed otherwise. I was going to be a great mother to little Chloe and a loving wife to my husband Richard, whom I loved more than life itself. I was going to put this miserable event that had happened to me on the beach behind me and pretend it never had occurred. My mother-in-law's persuasive words had been like sweet music to my ears. Of course my baby was Richard's. The monster on the beach had not impregnated me with his rancid sperm. I watched Richard cradling my baby in his arms, his face lighting up like a lighthouse. It was so bright with the adoration he felt towards little Chloe, and I was equally in love with her, until I wasn't. In a moment of brazen courage, when Chloe was about six months old, something made me send off for a DNA test, because one way or another I needed to absolutely ensure that the monster that attacked me on the beach was in no way my little child's father. I felt so confident that Chloe was Richard's progeny. It was true, she looked exactly like him, but I needed to know the truth. When the DNA results arrived in the post, I surreptitiously locked myself in the bathroom, as I couldn't allow anyone to see what I was getting up to. With trembling fingers and a thumping heart, I attempted to open the envelope several times, but my hesitancy consumed me. What if Chloe is not Richard's child, I thought. What then? Then I heard a voice in my head saying, Of course she's Richard's child. Eventually, in a moment of fleeting boldness, I savagely ripped open the envelope, and when I discovered Richard was not the father of little Chloe, I began to physically fall apart at the seams.
It couldn't be true. It just couldn't. I couldn't cope with the revelation. It was like I'd been run over by a forklift truck. In the days that followed, I could only look at my girl with disgust. She was the progeny of a monster. I realised in that moment I needed to get as far away from little Chloe as I possibly could, which was why I abandoned Richard and little Chloe and quickly moved to Florida. I did, however, call my mother to tell her what was going on. She was in total shock about the whole thing. Mum, just so you know, I'm leaving Richard and Chloe. I don't know how long I'm going to be away for, but I can't bear to look at Chloe without feeling violently sick, I told her. Goodness gracious, love. It sounds as if you've got postnatal depression. Those feelings you are having are perfectly normal. You can get treatment and medication for the condition. I promise you that, love. You'll feel much better. You can't possibly leave Chloe and Richard like this. They mean the world to you. I'll take you to the doctor myself. Everything's going to be absolutely fine. I promise you that. I'll never feel fine, Mum. I will never feel fine. This, this is not depression. You don't know that for sure, my love. You can go and see a specialist and a psychologist. We'll get this nipped in the bud, I promise you. And you'll feel so much better about it all. Mum, there is something I haven't told you. Something really, really bad. You're scaring me, darling. What have you done? I haven't done anything, Mum. But this, this concerns Chloe. What do you mean, love? What do you mean it concerns Chloe? I do wish that you wouldn't speak in riddles like you do. Mum, I don't know how to tell you this. But Chloe, Chloe's not Richard's baby. But of course she's Richard's baby, love. You only have to look at her to know she's Richard's little girl. Where is all this absurd stuff coming from? Mum, it's true. Chloe isn't Richard's baby. There was an awkward silence at the end of the line, and my mother's quiet voice said, You didn't, did you, love? Uh, you, you wouldn't, would you? You mean, did I have an affair? Did I cheat on Richard? Of course not, Mum. You know me better than that. It's not in my nature to cheat. Well, there you go, love. You have your answer, then. Chloe is Richard's baby. No, she's not, Mum. She's not Richard's baby. That's the problem. She's not. Well, whose baby is she, then, love? Excuse me for being a tad confused, but you're not making any sense. Mum, Mum, I was raped. You were what, love? Say that again. I was raped, Mum. But I don't understand, love. When were you raped? This can't be right. It just can't. When did this happen to you, love? Do you remember the day that a dead body was washed up onto the beach? Do you remember that day, Mum? Well, how could I forget it, love? It does rather stick in the memory, doesn't it? You're talking about the John Doe the police are trying to still identify. The very same. That dead man. He raped me, Mum. He what? asked my mother. You heard me, Mum. That John Doe raped me on the beach. Chloe is his little girl. No, that can't possibly be true, love. Please tell me this is some kind of warped joke of yours. Because if it is, I don't find it remotely funny, love. You're not pulling my leg, are you? Mum, I wish I was. But it's true. I've got the DNA test to prove that Chloe is not Richard's. And I haven't been with any other man except the man that raped me. So isn't it obvious whose baby she is? You were raped, love. Why didn't you say anything? Why didn't you go to the police at once to report the crime? Why did you not tell me what happened to you? I'm very disappointed, dear. I'm your mother, for goodness sake. You were raped. You need emotional support, love. But I'm always here for you. You know that you can always talk to me about anything. Mum, I couldn't even admit what happened to myself, let alone you. 
and least of all Richard. I felt so dirty. I felt disgusting. I just couldn't go to the police. I didn't want to think about this any more. I wanted to obliterate it from my memory, from my mind. It would have been easier to put it behind me if Chloe was Richard's girl. Calm down, love, calm down. This is not the end of the world. Chloe is a beautiful little girl. And even if she is the progeny of a monster, that doesn't make her one. We'll sort this out, don't you worry. But I still believe you need to get justice, don't you? The evil monster that raped you should be put behind bars, locked away for good. Men like him do not deserve to draw any breath. Ma'am, for goodness sake, the man is dead. Have you forgotten that? My mother was silent for a brief moment. Then in a soft voice she said, Of course he is dead, isn't he? Do you know how he died, love? You didn't, did you? I mean, I wouldn't blame you, of course, if you did. It would be regarded as self-defence. Every court in the land would be on your side in regards to that. Ma'am, for goodness sake, I didn't kill him, if that's what you're thinking. The man was huge. I only weigh 120 pounds. He was at least twice my size. He attacked me with a knife, which I threw into the ocean. Well, how did he die exactly, love? How did he manage to die on that beach? They found him floating in the waves. The cause of death was drowning. A Bigfoot killed him, Mum. A what, love? Now, is this some kind of a joke? No, I'm being deadly serious, Mum. A Bigfoot killed my attacker. One minute he was all over me, raping me. The next minute he was screaming for help. I looked up to see him dangling in a male Bigfoot's arms, screaming for his life. The Bigfoot treated him like a cockroach, Mum, that needed to be exterminated. He literally took the man into the seawater, submerged him under the ocean waves, and I watched him die. Then that Bigfoot sat with me on the beach until I managed to compose myself. Mum, he was incredible. He didn't say anything to me. He didn't talk. We just sat together. He came to my rescue. Even Snoopy liked him and licked his fingers. Oh, it was just so wonderful what he did for me, Mum. He walked home with me. I felt like I'd been rescued by an angel. Oh, goodness gracious me. I don't know how to react to any of this, love. This is all too much to handle. Think about it, dear. Not all angels that come to our rescue have to have a halo or wings. Angels can come to us from God in many guises, you know. This Bigfoot was clearly an angel to you. That evil man could have killed you, love. Disposed of you in the waves, sliced your neck. I can't bear to think about any of this. I don't think my heart can stand it. Mum, Richard can never know about this. Do you understand? It'll destroy him. I need to leave home for a while. Get my head around this, Mum. I need you to keep the secret from me. Promise you will. Sweetheart, running away from home is not the answer. We can get you help. We can sort this problem out. Mum, I'm not in a position to be a good mother right now. If I look at Chloe too closely, I'll see the monster staring back at me. I don't trust myself to be around her at the minute. I'm consumed with such anger over what happened. Sweetheart, you know I'm on your side. I won't say a single word to Richard, but I don't think you should brush this under the carpet, love. You should go to the police. Get this whole wretched mess sorted out. Mum, the man that attacked me is dead. It's over now. I just need to get away. Things can go badly awry with the police. They could get things all twisted. And I don't want any of this. Very well, dear. Have it your way. You do what you need to do. And I will try to calm the storm down with Richard. Mum, you're the best. That's why I love you so much. You're the best. Sweetheart, please get some counselling wherever you go. You're a great mother. Chloe needs you. So does Richard. And so do I. You must remember Chloe didn't ask for any of this to happen. She's still your little girl, with your blood running through her veins. And you would do well to remember that. Chloe doesn't need a mother like me at the moment, Mum. I'm not in a good place at the moment.
Well, that's understandable, love. Of course it is. Do what you need to do. I will tell everyone you needed a break to just get your head sorted out and that you'll be back. Your secret is safe with me. You're right. Richard does not need to know about any of this. So there we are. That is the end of part three. Part four is tomorrow night. And I look forward to you joining me then. Until next time, goodbye and good night.